We have a commitment date for the first of two high-profile recruitments in the month of August. We'll talk about that and so much more on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on every podcast platform imaginable, and YouTube. Hit that subscribe button and that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. And this segment is brought to you just like every recruiting segment on the Locked On Network by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. And we've got so much recruiting nuggets to discuss and, and work through. And off the top, we're going to touch on Williams Nguyenary, the five-star defensive end prospect, the number one prospect in the on 300 rankings and a top five prospect elsewhere. Set a commitment date for August the 14th. Which uh, if you're okay, where is that on the calendar? That would be a week from this coming Monday. So a week from this coming Monday, we will uh, have the answer to where, where is Williams? When are you going to play college football? We think, right? And I guess the other the other uh, piece of news here with Williams Winery is, though it kind of feels like almost a formality in this recruitment, just given the conversations that we've had here, John, and I think many others have had, we do have a top five officially for Williams Winery, though I think we've pretty well known what that is. And maybe some would say it's a top three, maybe a top two, but okay, the official top five from Williams Winery Winery will choose on August 14th between Georgia, Missouri, Oregon, Oregon, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. So there's your final five for Winery. And if you look at you know what some of the recruiting analysts are saying across the country, um, it, it's kind of fascinating because you'll see, you know, Tennessee say it's OU and Tennessee. You'll see uh, Missouri say it's OU and Missouri. Uh, you'll see Georgia say it's OU and Georgia. So what's the common denominator here for Williams Nunnery? The University of Oklahoma. And there's a, a lot of really good reasons why he might choose the University of Oklahoma. When he talked with Hayes Fawcett of On3, he talked about the relationships that he has with Miguel Chavis and Todd Bates, you know, the defensive end and defensive tackles coach for the University of Oklahoma. Why? I mean, he's talked at length in the past about their plan to utilize his skill set on the defensive line, both as an edge rusher and as an interior defensive lineman, you know, especially on pass rushing downs. So, I mean, yes, Georgia's the national champion. They're the, the top dog, no pun intended in the nation right now. So you kind of have to take them seriously in any defensive commitment or recruitment, but it seems like, you know, the guys that are really, really in the know, like a Parker Brandon, George is not really in the final two discussion, final three discussion. Um, what it sounds like in all the buzz is that it's Oklahoma and Missouri, Missouri, the in-state you know, school, an hour and a half away from Lee's summit where he plays his high school ball at Lee summit North. And then Oklahoma, you know, has been probably the favorite for the longest time in this one. It's just a matter of now closing and getting the commitment and then getting that commitment to signing day. And again, Oklahoma's got some nice pieces up its sleeve in this recruitment, as we've talked time and time again about. Okay, Uh, North Kansas City High School, right? But still from the KC metro area in recent five-star signee P.J. Adabare. Uh, Caden Green, of course, freshman on this uh, Oklahoma football team as well, is from Lee's Summit North. Kamari Moore, a commit in the 2025 class. 
That's right. You guessed it from Lee's Summit North. And oh, by the way, Isaiah Mosey, uh, of course, uh, we think maybe trending toward Oklahoma and Jamar Mosey uh, played for Oklahoma. So there's a lot of ties that point in Oklahoma's direction in this recruitment. And yet it feels like you just you just got to beat the the urge, the desire to stay home and play for Missouri. And, and that is a that is a reasonable draw and it's understandable why that would make sense and it's the reason why oklahoma is able to get so many in-state kids right now is because the the vibes are very positive the energy is very positive the culture is changing and is something that recruits are highlighting on every visit and that culture is going to be a part of what draws williams Winery to oklahoma if he does end up committing some other recruiting nuggets we got to get into uh, the sooners got a commitment from santa fe High school in Edmonds, Bergen Kaiser, a defensive end prospect who may not have had a ton of power five offers, but he did have one power five offer that's quite interesting that he chose to just he decided he was going to walk on as opposed to go to Oklahoma State on scholarship. So, I mean, like I said, everything is very positive for Oklahoma, even coming out of a six and seven season. And it's it's drawing it's creating gravity, drawing players to the program. And might I tell you that if you'd like to watch Bergen Kaiser or I don't know, a Mr. Isosa this season, Edmund Santa Fe games, by the way, will be uh, streamed live on KRefsports.tv. So a uh, friendly plug uh, for us over there. But uh, Bergen Kaiser, you mentioned the Oklahoma State offer. That's, of course, notable. You're talking about an in state kid that says no thanks to the full ride from Oklahoma State for the walk-on opportunity at OU. And yet he he also, by the way, had offers from UNLV, Sam Houston State, uh, Tulsa, another in-state school, and then uh, Army, Air Force, Navy. So there were big-time offers that Kaiser turned down. But I think that this just shows us, John, that, again, we, we thought this was the case, but a three-star kid picking Oklahoma when there were other scholarship offers on the table tells me that the – well, first of all, the ability to come play for Brad Vittables in Oklahoma is very, very attractive. But the the name image likeness component to this, uh, I'm no uh, rocket surgeon, John, but typically you're not turning down uh, a free ride for no money at all. So I, I would say name image and likeness is very competitive for Oklahoma. And uh, again, just beyond that, to, to win this recruitment when you had the in-state offers from both Oklahoma State and Tulsa is, John, I mean, it's gigantic. Yeah, again, a, a guy who's got great size, great you know ability, is a very productive player at Edmond Santa Fe, uh, flying under the radar a little bit and could be similar to a Taylor Wayne uh, who really kind of saw his stock rise throughout his senior season. Wouldn't be surprising to see the same with Kaiser. A couple Devins we got to talk about. Uh, Devin Harper, 2024 offensive line prospect out of Louisiana that Oklahoma has offered a four-star kid um, in the class and someone that, again, a very talented prospect that uh, Bill Biedenboe has his sights on. He's the uh, you know number 24 interior offensive lineman, according to Rivals, number eight, according to 247 Sports, uh, the number three prospect in the state of Louisiana. So, again, a very, very intriguing prospect right there. And then, Josh, the kind of big-time news, and who knows where this will land, but Oklahoma ended up in the uh, the top 10 for five-star cornerback Devin Sanchez, again, in the 2025 class. They'll have some big-time you know, teams to try and knock off. You know, Michigan, Alabama, LSU, Texas A&M, Texas, USC, Florida State, Oregon, and Ohio State. So kind of a who's who in the recruiting battle for Devin Sanchez. Oklahoma just feels like they're off to such a great start in that 2025 class. So uh, that's very, very exciting. Speaking of individuals spurning Oklahoma State for OU, well, a little little bedlam switcheroo. And, of course, uh, we'll tell you about Kelly Maxwell here in just one moment. But first things first. LinkedIn, LinkedIn jobs. We're always spreading the word, baby. Post your job for free at linkedin.com backslash locked on college, because these days, oh man, every new potential hire, it's a high stakes wager, or at least it feels like it for your small business. And you don't want to be, I, I like to say, John, you don't want to be 
95%. You want to be 100% certain that you've got access to the best qualified candidates available. And again, that's why you're going to check out LinkedIn Jobs, linkedin.com backslash locked on college, where you can post your job for free. They're going to help you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster and easier. Post your job for free, linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, uh, terms and conditions apply. So, the Bedlam switcheroo. Kelly Maxwell mm -hmm. is uh, officially coming to the University of Oklahoma. And, you know, you think about this transfer portal cycle for Oklahoma softball, John, and it has been, uh, it has been dramatic. It has been exciting. It has been eventful. It starts with Jordy Ball, and then you're kind of wondering all along, okay, brought in the young arm in Peyton Monticelli that did some very, very nice things in year one at Wisconsin, the 80-some-odd strikeouts in, in 80 innings, three years of eligibility remaining there, didn't play with a great defense behind her, will join a defense that has been number one in America. So that alone, right, to join what you already had in Nicole May in a rising Kirsten deal, in a rising S.J. Guerin, you, you felt pretty good about that addition. OU was not done. They decided, hey, let's go get Keeney right out of Liberty, who, again, more the – uh, established veteran, one year of eligibility remaining, and yet all along we were wondering, okay, there's two big, two big pitching arm names out of the portal, and it was Elena Vodder, and it was of course Kelly Maxwell, and so now we get the news that Oklahoma has indeed, in addition to what it's already done, which is very impressive in the circle, John, out of the transfer portal after you lost the nation's uh, best pitcher in Jordy Ball. They go get arguably, if you want to say Vodder, then fine, so be it, say Vodder. But Maxwell, if it's not Vodder, is right there, a close second, and has every right for the case to say this was after Jordy Ball, the top arm in the transfer portal. <laughs> and the rich gets richer, right? Yeah, I, I think you have to look at Kelly Maxwell as, I mean, maybe not on the same level as Jordy Ball, but just right behind her. I mean, six times she's won big 12 pitcher of the week. She was the 2022 big 12 co-pitcher of the year. Uh, she's got a career ERA of 1.58 over 500 innings of work. Uh, you know, this past season, she went 21 and five with a 1.21 ERA. Sorry, this is in 2022. She went 21 and five with a 1.21 ERA. This last season, she went just 16 and seven with a 191 ERA, but there's talk that maybe she had a bit of a finger uh, issue going on where she wasn't able to grip the ball very well. Uh, sorry, saw a story about that actually today as I was just looking at um, all the Kelly Maxwell stuff uh, that might have affected her rise ball, her spin, you know, throwing off speed stuff, uh, which has an impact. Um, again, you're talking about a very, very experienced pitcher, somebody who's been to the Women's College World Series, you know, been deep in the NCAA tournament, played big games in the Big 12 Conference. And now you get to add that to your arsenal uh, with a, a really, really deep and really, really good you know, pitching rotation that is going to I think it's going to benefit everybody. You know, you talk about Carly Keeney, Carly Keeney. I mean, she threw a ton of innings for Liberty. You know, everybody looks at, you know, the final stats. But you look at how many innings she threw and it's that's no wonder why sometimes she was a bit of a roller coaster because you're if you're being overworked eventually that's going to come back and get you but in big moments in big time matchups she came through whether it was against Oklahoma early in the season or against UCLA or to you know extend their season um against uh, Grand Canyon uh, before they fell in the uh, the regional uh, final i mean she was clutch and then Kelly Maxwell we know like we know what she brings to the table she's done it for 4 years at Oklahoma State and and has been nothing but excellent. Um, and again, you get to put her in front of the best defense in America with the best offense in America. And there's a good chance you're going to see those numbers improve, especially if you're not asking her to throw 200 innings uh, every single season or throw, you know, seven innings every game like she was having to do with Oklahoma State. She's going to get the benefit of Oklahoma's run rules. You know, she's going to get the benefit of Oklahoma's defense where she's going to be fresh down the stretch into the postseason. Uh, a lot of what Oklahoma State suffered in, you know, what was it, May, when they kind of went on a bit of a slide. Some of it was Kelly Maxwell and the, and the finger issue. Some of it was just 
your pitcher being overworked a little bit too. But then she recovered and she pitched really, really well in the postseason when they got into the NCAA tournament. Well, the other thing Oklahoma John has added here, all, all of the pieces that you discussed and the health, you know, that improves. Well, naturally, you're going to get a better version of Kelly Maxwell. But Maxwell is someone that has been the, the number one on a staff. And yes, uh, it's nice to take a little bit of that load away at times. And yet for both Keeney and Maxwell, they've been that they know what it's like to step into the circle and have that pressure on the shoulders. That's no, that's no big deal. That's nothing new. And for Maxwell, Oh, by the way, I've got the women's college world series experience as well to, uh, to go alongside what Nicole may has in the, uh, the experience that he, that she has for Oklahoma. So now you think about that one, two tandem, inside the circle for OU boy that is uh that's a really tough duo for anybody to match or top in uh, in softball and then beyond that okay you've got Kirsten Deal who was the number one pitcher coming in number one player coming in you've got uh Keeney who again has all that experience Monticelli who I think is a, an incredible rising talent from Wisconsin and SJ Guerin so they are just it's a filth of riches for Oklahoma. They are spoiled with riches now, Oklahoma. And again, it's like crazy talk. We've done this song and dance before. Stop, uh, stop if you feel like this is deja vu. But I mean, is Oklahoma, do they, are they ending up with a better staff again? I mean, top to bottom, they have so much depth now all of a sudden in this uh, rotation. It's just awesome what Jen Roach is going to have to work with. Well, and what's fascinating is seeing the evolution of softball pitching staffs where it was like you had one, you know, person that you just rode their arm all season long and you had another, you know, a secondary option that you'd go to if you had to, but really you wanted, you know, your ace to pitch every game as many innings as possible. But now, I mean, they've got four pitchers that they could probably roll out there and start in May, Maxwell, uh, Keeney. And, you know, Kirsten Deal, who Patty Gasso spoke very, very highly of in response to the Jordy Ball transfer. Um, and then you've got a couple pitchers in Monticelli and S.J. Guerin, who could p- probably split that Kirsten Deal relief role uh, from a year ago, where they're the ones kind of getting those those later innings, um, getting opportunities maybe against some of the, the lesser competition on the schedule. But, I mean, you could roll with a, 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 rota- a legit rotation of four pitchers and just keep everybody fresh all season long or do like they did uh, through the postseason where, okay, you know, uh, so, you know, somebody's going to start the first three innings and then we're going to roll out, you know, Keeney in the final three innings or uh, however Patty Gasso decides to go about it. She and Jennifer Rocha, they're the Queens of softball. They can do however they want, but man, an abundance of talent. And I think that's going to just benefit everybody on the roster. And it probably goes without saying, but we'll say it anyways. The back to back to back national champion. If there was even a hiccup of worry, it's gone for this Oklahoma softball program with that lineup mixed with this pitching staff. It didn't necessarily feel like this was going to wind up being the case, John. And yet we did say, okay, let's wait and see how everything uh, plays out for Oklahoma because. After Jordy Ball leaves, sure, it doesn't look like Oklahoma's this head and shoulders favorite in softball that they've been. And yet we said then somebody, a bunch of folks are going to jump at the opportunity to come join this thing at the University of Oklahoma. And lo and behold, you've gotten three very, very talented arms that have done just that. And so, again, Oklahoma, John, if there was a, that little hiccup where you thought, OK, this is not the, the overwhelming favorite. No, they're back. They're the overwhelming favorite. To go along with a lineup that features Jada Coleman, Tiara Jennings, Kinsey Hansen, Alyssa Brito. I mean, what more could you ask for? It's going to be a good team yet again, looking for that four Pete in 2024. Final thing we're going to talk about is does Oklahoma have a trap game on the schedule? And could it be a team that's kind of surprising? We'll talk about that next, but first let's talk to you about our friends over at eBay Motors. 
For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop at eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. And don't forget to be here every Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time, for our weekly live show. Josh mentioned on August 14th, Monday, August 14th, the commitment of Williams Winery will go down. We'll have a lot to talk about that, whichever way it goes. Um, if it goes Oklahoma's way, we'll be ecstatic on the live show talking with y'all answering your questions so again subscribe to the show so that you can be notified when we go live every monday night trap games this is always a popular topic of discussion every single year a year ago it was tcu that was considered a trap game for the oklahoma sooners turned out to be accurate uh, especially after dylan gabriel went down with a concussion this year that trap game might be none other than the kansas jayhawks um, I lost the story that you sent me, Josh. Here it is. Uh, over at Heartland Sports, Brian Clinton picked a trap game for each team in the Big 12. And for Oklahoma, it was the Jayhawks um, or UCF in Week 8 or Oklahoma State in Week 10. Um, that's who they're facing uh, surrounding Kansas. So the Jayhawks with the Offensive Player of the Year in the preseason for the Big 12, Jalen Daniels. It's going to be quite a test for Sooners defense. We think is going to be better. You know, it's hard to find a sleeper game. I feel like on this schedule, the way that uh, it sets up, Kansas is not the Kansas of old anymore. And Jalen Daniels is the big 12 preseason offensive player of the year, John. So I, I don't know. I mean, if you want to say that's the sleeper game of the year, I'm not going to totally argue with you, but it's tough to totally cakewalk past a team that again, has the Big 12 preseason offensive player of the year playing quarterback in Jalen right. Daniels. So, you know, there's nothing in the non-conference. I don't think that's, you know, sleepwalk city. You got Arkansas State and then SMU at home at Tulsa, I guess, maybe, but I don't know that they're good enough, John. And then, uh, you know, at Cincinnati, with it being the, the first Big 12 game for you after a disappointing season overall and obviously a disappointing Big 12 slate for Oklahoma last year. Mixed with the fact that, yeah, this is Cincinnati's welcome into the league. So that will have OU's full attention. You know, maybe, and this is crazy because I, I don't think this team's going to be very good. And, oh, by the way, I don't think they're going to have their starting quarterback. Iowa State before Texas, no Hunter Deckers. I mean, that to me is more the potential sleeper date than at KU or the UCF game before Kansas, I would look at as maybe a sleeper date. It's tough for me to get on board and co-sign with KU. Yeah, I can totally buy what you're selling because they're not going to sleep on Kansas. Kansas put up 40 points on them last year without Jalen Daniels. So with Jalen Daniels, that defense is going to be on red alert because you know if Jalen Daniels has the start to the season that he had last year, you're talking about a potential Heisman contender that this defense is going to be tested by. Uh, I'm with you on Iowa State. I think that would have been a popular pick had Hunter Deckers not gotten in trouble, allegedly, uh, for gambling on sports. Um, but even then, that game being in Norman kind of takes a little bit of the, the shine off of Iowa State a little bit. Um, but I'm with you. I think maybe that's in, uh, the Cincinnati game I might have gone with just because. Um, but being it's the first Big 12 game, it's on the road. I think they'll kind of have their, you know, their antennas up. They'll be ready for it. Um you know, maybe BYU, you know, coming out of West, out of the West Virginia game, getting ready for TCU, you know, the following week, BYU could be a potential game that kind of catches them by surprise. But it, it's fascinating because, you know, teams like Oklahoma State, BYU, we don't quite know what they're going to look like just yet. I think we'll have a better indication of who they are as we get closer to those games. 
but I, I don't really worry too much about those teams. Um, so it's like we've talked about several times on the show, like the schedule doesn't scare anybody, you know, that Texas game, you know, that's the big one every single year. And this team is going to be a much different team than what they took into the cotton bowl last year that I think even most Oklahoma fans are feeling a little bit more confident about what that game is going to look like now than maybe they even did three, six months ago. So it's hard to find a trap game. I can understand Kansas. You know, you're going into Lawrence could be the last time in a, in a long while that you do make that trip. But the Jalen Daniels hype is going to be on uh, full, you know, it's going to be full speed ahead at that point, especially if Kansas is winning games uh, that I don't think it's going to catch Oklahoma by surprise. Any other thoughts on that before we get out of here, Josh? Yeah. Again, I just think it's difficult because for example, if you had at KU at Oklahoma, at Oklahoma state and then Kansas state at home in Norman the following week, then to me, even Bedlam might be a little bit of a trap game just because Oklahoma state's probably going to be a little bit down and you've got Kansas state or, or reverse that, right? You're going to KU and you got K state the next week, but it just doesn't work out that way for OU to where you've got those perceived heavy hitters again and again on the schedule of the big 12. And Oh, by the way, it's preceded by a difficult road trip. It just doesn't really shake out that way for Oklahoma on the schedule, which is good, right? Which is, uh, you know, theoretically, again, I think is one more reason for us to kind of sign on for the idea that this schedule sets up well for OU. And we are less than a month away from the season kicking off, and I can't wait to cover another year of Oklahoma football with y'all. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref. Josh on Ref. Sorry, I, that became Joff on Ref. Josh on Ref. Follow me on Twitter at John 9 Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Locked On Sooners Podcast. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. But until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams. Boomer Sooner.